And I cannot tell you how incredibly happy I am to be hosting Suzanne Goldberg. Suzanne is a close friend and a great colleague, and I've been wanting her and her partner, Lou, whom I'm also very happy to welcome to Jordan, uh, to come for a very long time. And so, welcome. Um, the timing of the talk uh, could also uh, not be better. Sadly, it could not be better. Um, although the Me Too movement has its roots in the United States, the message has global dimensions, including in this part of the world. Uh, it should, but often fails to resonate in the midst of uh, this part of the world, in this region. Uh, but as in the West, harassment is also an intersectional issue um, in, this, uh, in this region. It functions uh, of the same power dynamics and inequalities, and it affects all segments of society. The default assumption is here uh, very, very strong, that victims rather than harassers are to blame. Uh, women sometimes are harassed for merely occupying a public space, just for being, um, they get harassed. Uh, LGBTQ individuals face harassment, oftentimes violent harassment on the basis of their physical appearance, for daring to express themselves, and oftentimes for the mere suspicion of their sexual identity. Um, let's take Egypt, for example, a country that suffers from a particularly severe harassment problem. In 2017, President Sisi declared uh, the year as the year of the woman. But in that same year, Thomson Reuters named Cairo the most dangerous city in the world for women, okay, reflecting Egypt's pervasive harassment challenges. A 2017 report by UN Women and Promandu found that, sorry, okay, I do not like double, okay, found the following statistics which are quite alarming. 43% of Egyptian men believe that women like to be sexually harassed. That's what men believe. 84% of Egyptian women believe that women who dress provocatively deserve to be harassed. That's women speaking of women being harassed. Two-thirds of male respondents to the survey admitted to having sexually harassed women. And more than three-quarters of the men blamed their behavior on women's provocative clothing. So when women get harassed, don't be confused. It's their fault. It's their fault. They're inviting it on. It's women's fault that they get harassed, harassed. It's women's fault that they get raped. Arab women are fighting back throughout all of this through the framework of the Me Too movement, but countless other channels. Um, let me pick a couple. In Tunisia, the Enazida movement, um, which is Me Too in, uh, in Tunisian dialect, Enazida, uh, has taken hold over the last few weeks on Tunisian social media. Facebook pa their Facebook page has more than 17,000 members and 70, 000, more than 70,000 comments and posts. It's part, a, um, this, this has really skyrocketed after a video went viral of a 19-year-old student being harassed by a prominent politician in October in Nabel. The perpetrator, Member of Parliament, Zuhair Makhlouf, was sworn into Parliament last week when the new Parliament took office in Tunisia. He will likely have immunity from prosecution, despite a 2017 law that criminalizes harassment in public spaces. According to a 2017 estimate, 97% of Tunisian sexual harassment cases go unreported and unpunished. This is especially troubling, uh, including for me, having written about the uniqueness of uh, Tunisia's uh, experience, its unique place in the Arab world, particularly in terms of the rights of women um, that have been the, uh, granted to them as a result of the 1956 uh, Code of Statute Personnel that gave women more rights in Tunisia in 1956 than in, they enjoy today anywhere else in the Arab world. It's the only Arab country where polygamy among Muslim men uh, is outlawed. Uh, birth control 
became legal um, in Tunisia in the early 60s. In 1973, the same year as Roe versus Wade in the United States, abortion became uh, legal in Tunisia. Other countries have recently seen variants of Me Too. In Lebanon, activists shared stories under uh, Mish Basita, it's not okay, and the Not Your Ashta. Uh, hashtags. Last year, Abad, a Lebanese NGO, started Shame on Who, a campaign against victim blaming. In Palestine, a 21-year-old Yasmin Mjalli launched a line of clothing branded with Not Your Habibti and other similar messages. Now let's turn to Jordan, where over the last month, many of us have been preoccupied with the um, uh, the incident uh, regarding uh, domestic violence in, in Jarash. Um, last Saturday, 300 people staged a sit-in near the Prime Ministry to call for better protections against women. Uh, they carried signs which read, Tafah al which means enough. Um, and, um, protest, uh, yeah, and, and this goes on. Activists last month published a short documentary, Jordan Speaks Up, in which students read anonymously submitted stories that documented sexual harassment. As important as all of these efforts are, the challenges remain formidable. And they're not unique to this region, of course. You know, they're quite universal. Uh, but perhaps uh, the more conservative the milieu is and the less advanced women's rights are, the less likely that there would be legal protections for harassment. And I know that Suzanne, uh, who will talk to us tonight about Me Too and the global challenge and best perhaps for addressing sexual harassment and misconduct, uh, will also deal with other gender-related issues. So Suzanne is the Executive Vice President for University Life at Columbia. She's also the Herbert and Doris Wetzler Clinical Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. She's recognized as an expert in sexuality and gender law, and she's worked with universities, private employers, and governments on addressing sexual harassment and misconduct. Um, she's working on a project for the American Law Institute to develop procedural frameworks for campus sexual misconduct cases. She's led Columbia's Sexual Respect and Community Citizenship Initiative, which seeks to promote a campus culture that reinforces sexual respect and rejects sexual harassment, sexual assault, and other forms of gender-based misconduct, and also empowers students to get help. She's also facilitated a very important initiative at Columbia called Awakening Our Democracy, which is a conversation series on disparities and justice issues at the forefront of the universities and the nation's consciousness. The 1619 conversations address the 400 years since the start of slavery in the United States, the nation's founding doctrines that enshrine basic individual rights and the inequalities rooted within the country's institutions. Suzanne is the inaugural um, occupant of the position of Executive Vice President for University Life. This position was started five years ago to deal with issues of sexual harassment and sexual respect on the university campus. And President Lee Bollinger wanted someone who could be focused on student and intellectual life and who could lead campus conversations around these issues and uh, help serve as the connective tissue across the university and facilitate the healthy and safe campus life. I don't think he could have chosen anybody better or more sensitive or more expert than Suzanne Goldberg. Um, Suzanne also frequently plays and wins in law school basketball games. Uh, she was one of the first girls on the White Plains New York Little League basket baseball team. And she recently ran in President Lee Bollinger's annual 5K Fun Run. Uh, Suzanne graduated with honors from Brown University and went on to serve as a Fulbright Fellow at the National University of Singapore. She earned her JD at Harvard Law School, and she is also the recipient of Columbia Law School's Willis L. M. Rees Prize for Excellence in Teaching. It really means a lot to me, Suzanne, that you are here, and it really means a lot to me, Lou, that you are here with her. And uh, I'm looking forward to spending time with you in Jordan over the next few days, and thank you so much for sharing of yourself with us here this evening. Please join me in welcoming Suzanne Goldberg.
Safwan, thank you so much. I, uh, I'm so happy to be here uh, this evening to talk with you about these issues. And I first want to say that Safwan, when the, from the moment I met him, he invited me to come be with you in Jordan. And I could not be happier that the time has finally come. Uh, salam, marhaba, marhaba, yeah, marhaba. Ana Saida Liwujudi Makom Alaila. And the rest will be in English. Uh, so I, I really do want to thank Safwan and the staff of the Global Center for, for here for welcoming me. It is really an honor to be here, and I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. Um, I'll talk for a while, and then I look forward also to being in conversation, to having your questions and hearing your thoughts. Uh, so I want to talk with you about two questions, and they're linked. The first is, why is the conversation we are having now about sexual harassment and gender violence different from what it was uh, even uh, some years ago? And the second is, what can we learn from this difference in a way that helps us to move things forward, that helps us to change the situation? So I'll start by talking about the Me Too movement, and Safwan just gave us some really uh, important examples of what's been happening around here as well as around the world. Uh, I want to talk to the, about the Me Too movement, where it came from, how we got here. Second, I want to talk about some challenges that we see in addressing, or at least that I see, in addressing sexual harassment and gender violence. And then third, I want to offer six action steps that I have come to see as important in this area. Um, I'll offer a lot of examples from the United States, so I realize not every one of them will be exactly relevant here, but hopefully they'll be somewhat useful, at least for the st starting a conversation. So first, the Me Too movement. Um, I assume many of you here are familiar with it since it was in the title of my talk, uh, uh, but I'll just remind you that um, <clears throat> in the US, the idea of Me Too actually started before a famous actress uh, sent a text uh, asking, using the phrase Me Too. It started uh, uh, more than 10 years ago uh, in, uh, but with a woman named Tarana Burke, who was a woman advocating for women of color in the United States and for young women and girls who had suffered from sexual violence. And she used the framework of Me Too to do two things, to, to tell young women and girls, you are not alone when you are experiencing violence, and second, to encourage not only a sense of solidarity, but also a sense of power, a sense of empowerment, that together by talking about these issues, by recognizing the problems as a shared challenge, we can make a difference. Then, as you may know, uh, a, a famous actress, uh, uh, Alyssa Milano, I'm, I'm, yes, that's the right name. I'm not a celebrity person, so I'm, that's my weak point here. Um, Alyssa Milano texted out, um, have you experienced sexual harassment or assault? Say, me too, if you have. And she was flooded with texts online, it was on Twitter, uh, or Twitter, tweets, saying, yes, me too, I have experienced this. And as Safwan described, this idea of me too or, and, it, and it's been rephrased in different languages around the world, has come to mean this sense of coming together around horrific experiences often, and also coming together around addressing the challenge. Um, but the conversation is not new. Um, people have been having this, advocates have been talking about sexual harassment and gender violence for many, many years. Um, in Jordan, as you mentioned, throughout the Middle East, throughout the world. Um, some of you may be familiar that there was a, a major UN conference on women in Beijing that took as its centerpiece issues related to sexual harassment and gender violence. Do you remember when that was? 1995? And then, of course, if we go back in time, you can see historically these conversations happening around the world. I'll just give you uh, two examples from the United States that I ran across recently. One was in testimony in front of the United States Congress in a, 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 a labor hearing, a hearing about employment, where a labor organizer stood up and he said, you know, women, or they call them ladies on the floors of shops, are chased around by their supervisors and sexual face demands for sexual favors in order to keep their jobs. Right? That was actually in the late 1800s. 
And then before then, US law, uh, as well as law around the world, has accepted that sexual violence is part of, for women, part, a natural part of being married, and even for women, just part of what is acceptable walking around the streets, right? As you said, women are often blamed, both in the law and in, so, so, and in society, for experiencing sexual violence. Um, so what has changed? Why are we having a different conversation today? And I do believe we are having a different conversation. I want to offer you two reasons, two things that have changed. Uh, the first is we are in a time, uh, certainly in the United States, and I think around the world, where the old order is being questioned, right? Where what has been accepted, inequalities that have been accepted for many, many years are coming under question. In the United States, that has taken the form of new challenges to racial injustice, and racial inequality, police violence based on race. It has also, uh, <clears throat> The challenges in the United States are also in connection with econ economic inequality. So we had a movement called Occupy Wall Street that challenged economic inequality and, and gained some significant traction. Um, and we see this in different, obviously we see this in challenges to traditional governments around the world. So, so we are in this moment where questions are being asked in a public way about inequality and the natural order of things that haven't been asked so much in the past, or at least not as vocally. The second piece that has changed is one that is obvious but is important to mention, which is social media. And it has changed things in two very important ways. The first is that it, the one, and the, the obvious one is that it has enabled people to connect, right? So if you want to call a demonstration now, it's not a question of as it was when I was uh, <clears throat> starting out of photocopying a lot of flyers and mailing them around or hanging them on, on walls to get people to come, but you send a tweet and people come. I don't know how the, uh, the uh, demonstration was organized in Jirash, but I assume that social media played some role in getting the word out. And then in getting the word out about the demonstration, even for people who were not there. The second piece about social media that's so important is that it enables people to get support. Right? It enables people to tell their stories, even anonymously, and gain support from one another. And although social media is a significant place for backlash, right? there is a lot of hostility, so many violent threats come over social media, it also is this place of empowerment. So to me, these two, co these two in combination, the uh, willingness to challenge what has long been accepted as the natural order, and then the ability to, to create community through social media and to challenge isolation has been, have, are the two pieces that have been critical to putting us in a different place. So what do we do with that information? I think there's an important lesson in here, which is that one of the critical ways to challenge the status quo, to challenge the widespread acceptance of violence against women and harassment against women, is to recognize that isolation, isolation of women and others, women and men, but I'm focusing in particular on women today, uh, but women and men and transgender people who experience violence, uh, to be able to challenge that isolation that has been experienced and to be able to say you are part of a community, here is help and here is a community of people to support you. That's critical. And so any steps we take are rooted in this understanding that challenging isolation is at the essence of what we must do. So I, before I turn to the six action steps, I want to say a word about two of, a piece of what makes this very hard to, to create the challenge and gain momentum. And I want to share one observation as well. These two examples come from the US experience, and they're not exactly analogous, but I, I, offer, them not, I offer them to show the power of assumptions about sex and gender. The first one is about orchestras in the United States. Maybe some of you are familiar with this. Uh, it was for many years that in U.S. orchestras, there, the, who, the only musicians who were playing in the orchestras were men. And it wasn't that women could not play the cello or the violin or the trumpet. Women just were not getting the jobs. 
Um, are you, some of you familiar with this? Mm -mm. So, yes. Um, so what, what did they do to change things? Some US orchestras decided they wanted to make a change. And so they put a screen in front of the auditions. And so now musicians would try out behind the screen. And what happened? Women started getting hired. But, and this is part of the important part of the story, after a while, the, the change did not, it, it increased the number of women, but the change plateaued. And what the, those in charge realized was that the people t assessing the musicians, the people uh, listening and, and making, doing the hiring, could hear the footsteps, right? They could hear the difference if a woman was walking across the stage in heels or in light shoes, or if a man was walking across the stage in heavier shoes. So they made an additional change, which was to put a rug on the, some stages so that the listeners could not hear whether it was a woman or a man auditioning. And in some settings, they have a man in heavy boots walk out alongside the musician so that the listeners can't tell. And why, why do I tell the story? It's, we're not talking about orchestras. I tell the story because it illustrates how powerful the pull is to see men and women as different, right? That, that there's just a deep desire to know, even from the listeners, am I listening to a man or a woman play the violin? Here's another story. It's a little bit different. It comes from an American television show, Saturday Night Live. Some of you know it, the show. So maybe you know, <clears throat> you know this story. <clears throat> yes, all of us. Um, so this is old Saturday Night Live. There was a character named Pat. And you couldn't tell if Pat was a man or a woman. And so Pat's friends would always try to figure out, is Pat a man or a woman? So they would say things like, Pat, what activities do you like? What are your hobbies? What kinds of magazines do you read? And Pat would give answers that did not answer the question, are you a man or a woman? And it drove them crazy because they couldn't figure out how to relate to Pat. And so finally the friends got together and they said, we know, let's get Pat to tell us the story of when Pat was born. And so, and we'll find out. So they go back in time, like in TV, and it gets all hazy, and they, and they see an image of Pat's parents standing in front of the crib, and they're so, the bassinet where the baby is, and they're, you could see they're so excited, and they, they're holding hands, and they look over the bassinet, and they say, it's a baby. <laughs> and the friends all, grown, as you would expect. You can find it on YouTube, I'm sure. Uh, but the point of that story, too, is that for many of us, maybe most or all of us, we find it very important to know if someone is a man or a woman to figure out how to relate to them. That can be fine, but it also tells us that there is a real challenge when we want to combat gender violence and gender harassment and sexual harassment because the idea of seeing men and women as different is so deeply rooted, not just intellectually, but for many people also emotionally. So when we think about challenging the different ways that women and men are treated and the different expectations of women and men in society, we have to keep in mind that the expectations are so so, so profound and so deep, and I would suggest they are so cross-cultural even if they look different from culture to culture. So we have a lot of challenge, and not a lot, maybe we can say some has changed, but there's a lot more to go. <coughs> I want to offer one other challenge, which is that uh, many people don't care, and many people think this is fine, and many people uh, see this as an issue that is not so important for them. So what do we do? First, I want to say something about the costs of not caring, because they are significant. In the educational setting, so at Columbia where I work, here are some of the costs of not caring about sexual harassment and gender violence. Students, don't, who, students who are being harassed, 
don't show up for class. They're not able to do their studies as well as other students. They, draw, they miss assignments, they skip exams. They, many of them drop out of school. There is data showing that young women who are sexually assaulted in school have among the highest rates of dropping out. <coughs> and then what happens to us as a society? We lose those contributions in critical ways. Um, let's think about workplaces. Whether public sector or private sector, whether NGO or fancy corporation, um, any setting, right? Workplace harassment, what happens? Employees call in sick. They don't, teams do not work as well. Environments become more difficult for supervisors to manage. <clears throat> Productivity drops off. Talented people leave. So there are real economic costs in addition to the social costs that are familiar to us. <clears throat> the same is, of course, true and sometimes worse in neighborhoods and in families. <clears throat> and the example of what happened in Jirash is an obvious one, where there's a loss to an individual, there is a loss to her family, there's a loss to her extended family, to all of the people who counted on the woman who was, who was grievously injured, and all of the people who are in the network connected to her. And there are obviously many more examples. A very basic point, though, is nobody, none of us, thrives if we are being harassed or assaulted. And so that is the demand to action. It is the call to action. And for me, it is the call to not giving up ever, even when it is so hard to keep doing the work. <clears throat> and so while it may seem easier sometimes to just not act, I think I would suggest the costs are too high for that. So I want to offer six action steps that I <clears throat> have, uh, that as, or as best practices, <clears throat> excuse me, and each of these aims in a different way to combat the isolation that I talked about in the beginning. Okay, so the first one is these are all basic, I should say. None of them will surprise you, but I'll just put them in an order that hopefully will be useful. The first one is what I would call norm setting and repetition. And it's a very, the basic idea is that it is very difficult to change the status quo, to change what is happening today, unless we talk about it, unless we identify clearly what's wrong, and we talk about what is okay and what's not okay. This is not only for severe violence, but this is for harassing interactions on the streets and in workplaces. Uh, but not everybody cares, as we just talked about. So this norm setting and repetition has two parts. First is explaining why these issues matter and talking about the costs of not acting and not caring. And the second is to repeat that repeat those points in many different forums, in, a, in, in, many, different, repeat, in many different forms, in, through policies, through setting expectations of behavior in the workplace, in schools, in our community, and in broader society. It's, this it looks like a steady stream of articles, po posts on social media, uh, policies, emails, posters, community discussions, demonstrations, whatever it takes. The point is that one is not enough, a few are not enough. There is a constancy to the conversation and a multi-dimensional, multi-form to the conversation that keeps it moving and that keeps it alive. Uh, for example, at Columbia, we have, all, have long had policies that forbid sexual harassment and assault. Yet there, was a very, there has been a very serious problem among students and vis-a-vis -vis students and faculty. And so we've learned that not only do we have to have a good policy, but we have to communicate it over and over and have a sexual respect initiative for students, have a briefing for faculty that takes place every year, have many different kinds of information sharing that I can talk about in the questions and discussion part if you would like. I'll give you another example. I worked on a case involving a, a significant sexual harassment uh, at Fox News, which is a, a, one of our major uh, news sources in the US. Well, I'm not sure uh, I would, everybody might agree that it's a news source, but it is a major source of information for many people. And 
There, I had the opportunity to look at their personnel handbooks and look at some of their training, and it was excellent, right? There was nothing wrong with the training. The problem was it wasn't taken seriously at the highest levels and at the basic management levels. So repetition, conversation regularly about what's right and wrong is important if we are ever going to change the very deep-seated uh, problems that we have related to sexual harassment and gender inequality. Talking over and over again, public hearings, public forums, demonstrations, private forums. Okay, that's number one. Number two is information access. Each one of us should be able to answer the question, where do I go if a friend need help, needs help? Where do I go if somebody I know or if for myself if I need help, but how can I help a friend? How can I help a colleague? That might seem easy, but as we know, it's usually not so easy. So what, why, why, why does that become hard? And <clears throat> hard to know? Uh, because it's hard to know where to look. Right? We can and what we can do there is create a hub uh, online, centralized somewhere, of information to answer that question. Where do I go if I need help? We found at Columbia, for example, that in a survey fi about five years ago or more of our students, we asked, do you know where to go if you need to help a friend? And about half of our students at the graduate level said they didn't know. It's not that we didn't have resources. We had a lot of resources, but we were not communicating them effectively enough. So we changed a lot of things. We created a website that we call Sexual Respect. You can Google Columbia and Sexual Respect and see all of that information. And then we repeated the information to students before they get to campus, during their orientation, during the semester when they have to do the sexual respect initiative, in posters, in little flyers that we hand out, lots and lots of ways to share that information. We also know, though, that sexual assault and sexual misconduct are among the most underreported crimes. Why is that? Often it's shame. People feel it's their own fault, and in a culture where that blames women, it's very easy to feel that way. Uh, People fear not being taken seriously, being retaliated against, uh, being embarrassed, not trusting that the, that the office that they report to will help them. And so that leads to two uh, concrete suggestions. One is if the systems really are not in place, then to have a kind of shadow reporting that people know where to go to report. And I'll give you a quick example of that. I met somebody uh, from Brazil recently who created an app. His was focused on violence against LGBT people. Um, this could also be created for gender violence, but an app that enabled people to report anonymously or with their names and to report the location where this was happening, where in the country. And so he pulled up the app and showed me the report, what the reporting looked like, which was not only in the big cities in Brazil, but the word had gotten out and so there was, you could see dots on the map all over the country where reports had been made. And that is very useful for advocates, of course, to be able to show, yes, this is a problem. Here is the volume. This is why we need resources. This is why we need education in schools. Uh, in addition is the multifaceted information campaigns that I talked about, sort of the, the many different ways of getting the word out. And, also, and for that, what's very useful, uh, even though I would say I'm not a celebrity person, what is very useful can be to have a celebrity, somebody who's well known or multiple people who are well known to talk in the community, in media, in the forums that they have a lot of access to, where they have a lot of maybe followers on social media to share the norms and to share how to get help. <clears throat> Third, in addition to norm sharing and repetition and information sharing is skills building. This also sounds basic, but it is something that can be quite difficult. Right? Many of us have difficulty stepping in when we see something is wrong. It's just hard, it's awkward, it feels bad. I was reading an article on, a, on the flight coming uh, to Amman where somebody was writing about being at a conference and they said, this was a woman, she was at a conference, a professional conference, she was walking over to see her boyfriend actually and she had two drinks in her hands at a reception. And a man who she did not know came up behind her and slid his hand up the back of her 
dress which had an opening and just sort of put his hand there. And she was so stunned in the moment, she didn't know what to say. He didn't know what to say. They did not want to cause a scene. She felt embarrassed, even though she had done nothing wrong. And, so, and they didn't know what to do. And, and then the man just slipped his hand away and he disappeared into the crowd. So what the two of them did was to create something for, uh, for the, this conference that has been picked up by other conferences, which is not only a code of conduct, but also a, repla a place to report at the conference and a commitment from the conference organizers to take action when somebody does something like this. Now, we see this, uh, I'll give you one other uh, short example, which was of a graduate student I heard about at an academic conference who was sitting between her professor and another graduate student, and she was at a dinner. Each of them reached over, each of these, there were two men on either sides of her, and they reached over and each put a hand on her leg. And she, and she just was frozen and did not know what to do, couldn't even move in the circumstances. And there are, of course, many more examples that are quite violent, much more violent and threatening than the ones I've described. Uh, so what do we do as a community? So with some of this in mind, uh, I'll just give you, again, a couple of examples. We've created a briefing at Columbia for our faculty to talk about these issues, not only about what's right and wrong, but also what to do when you see something going on. And we gave a list of top 10 ways you can do something or say something. And of course, the best way, the most straightforward way is to say, stop, or please stop, depending on your mood. You know, that's not OK. Right? You can say, that's not OK. You can do that as yourself. You can do that as somebody else. Um, sometimes, though, people don't want to do that, right? It's just, it's awkward. And so what do people do? I mean, think about what you've done. You go over to somebody and you show them a very important video of a cat doing something silly on YouTube. Or it doesn't have to be a cat, you know what I mean. Just something funny, distraction, right? Number two is distraction. If you don't want to confront directly, show a video, go up to a colleague or a friend um, and say, I have to meet with you about something and pull them out of the situation and then figure out a strategy for dealing with it after. There is a video made by students at a university that shows what they do at a party if somebody is... is, is um, sort of getting too close to a friend and they're worried about the person. Um, and they have a little bit of a dance squad. And so they go over and they kind of dance in between the two students and get the one away from the other. So there are lots of ways. There's not a magical solution. The point is to think about what works for you, what might you be comfortable doing, what might you be comfortable sharing with somebody else. So if skills building is number three, the number four is institutional trust. It's very hard to make change without having a process, an institution to go to to address a problem or a complaint. And so how do we create this? I'll just offer three concrete guideposts, understanding that every institution is different. And I should be clear that by institutions, I don't only mean the government. I mean schools, universities, I mean employers. I mean organizations, I mean any setting where people are gathered in a formal or informal way, uh, but where, the, where, there, where these issues might arise. And so the first, once there is a policy in place, is that the policy and the process should not be a mystery, right? Everybody should be able to, ex it should be explained in an easy way. So I'll give you one quick example. We have a, quite a long policy at Columbia for students about these issues. The first time I read it, um, it was very good and very powerful. It was also written um, the, in a way that would be well understood by law students, but maybe not everybody else. It had been written by, primarily by lawyers, and that's not surprising, and I'm a lawyer, I like to write policies. But when we are writing for our students at Columbia, we need to write so that every student can understand whether they are an 18-year-old first day of college, whether they are a student coming from another country and English is not their first language, whether they are a student in the arts or in engineering, everybody should be able to understand the policy and the process. The same is true at public institutions. The same to me should be true for government processes. Should not be a mystery. Uh, second, 
and this is also straightforward, but it is important for institutional trust that processes be fair for all involved, and that means fair for the accused person as well as for the person making the accusation. Important to have an impartial decision maker, somebody who is well trained. So what we say at Columbia is we train our decision makers to be impartial, fair, and sensitive to the issues involved. We use something called trauma-informed investigation to train people who are going to be interviewing and investigating situations that involve sexual assault or harassment or other misconduct. Why? Without that, who will come forward? People are not ever going to report or participate in a process if they can't trust it. And if the process is, process is not trustable for whatever reasons, then it may be worth thinking about, again, shadow processes, some ways to create processes that are meaningful. A third point uh, with respect to institutional trust is about having annual reports, something where decision makers can share what they're doing, how many reports come in, what some of the outcomes are in the aggregate, so no individual person can be identified from a report, and we have lots of examples of ours on Columbia Sexual Respect website. Uh, okay, two more quick points and then I'll stop and we can open to, to discussion. Um, fifth is to think about the structures for supervision in schools and workplace settings and elsewhere. Right? Sexual misconduct, sexual harassment, sexual violence often happens when somebody is isolated or causes someone to be isolated, as I said at the outset. And so that means that structures are important to try to get at the roots or the problems of, that, that are, of, the, of the isolation. Often people are afraid. Somebody with much more power is the perpetrator, and that is, can be another factor in increasing isolation. So what are some of the steps? This is a big challenge, of course, in our society. How do we think about this? I'll just share some of what we've done in the university setting. Some can be carried over to employers. Uh, handling super, having supervision of students, both younger and older, uh, be, take place with teams of teachers or teams of faculty rather than one individual, depending on the circumstance. Two, and this is for the employment setting, having senior managers really be, and middle, any manager, be accountable for what happens. Right? So often in settings I'm familiar with, the issue is that people know what's wrong, but they are, there's no accountability. So how do we get the accountability? It does need to come from the top of the organization. So my thought always when I work with organizations is to get the commitment as high up in the organization as it can go, and then use those people who are very high up to bring it up to the next level and continue the advocacy for many different vantage points. Obviously having clear codes of conduct at professional conferences and in other settings is important. Having more women in positions of authority sounds basic, um, but it has been proven over and over that that does change the dynamic. Not always, not perfectly, but it makes a very big difference. Um, having a government minister or government authority, per, somebody in the government in a position of authority to be paying attention to these issues is critical. Um, in it, whether, and again, whether it's in government or in other settings. And the one point I would add there, and it was, I, I, I was very heartened to see this in reading about the Jirash demonstration, is that there were very many, there were a lot of men, at least in the, I, you know, I read the English language newspaper, so I, I, that I only have that perspective, but many men were quoted. And it told me that there are a lot of men coming out on these issues as well as women. And that partnership between men and women is critical. The problem will never change without the partnership. Okay, and this is the last point, assessment. How do we know if anything is working? We have to ask ourselves over and over, is any of this making a difference? How is it making a difference? We can do surveys, we can do focus groups, we can have individual conversations, but doing this in a structured way so that we're gathering information to know what is working, what might be improved upon. Um, w one of the guideposts I use in this area, I think, is, is this idea of positive deviance. And the idea is that we look not only at the things that are wrong, but at what's working. It can be so hard 
in the settings where we work, especially on these issues, to feel like we're making progress. Because in some ways, it's the same conversation. We're talking still about gender violence. We're talking, talking still about sexual harassment. We've been talking about it for a long time. Um, just as we have been talking about a range of other inequities, inequalities, deep challenges societally across, in societies across the world. So if we can look at not only what's wrong, but what is working, that, for, uh, that can hold for us the seeds of finding the next step. It's as though I, always, I often think you get to a little bit of a top of a hill and you can start to see, well, what's next? What else might work? The things that you couldn't see before you got to the top of that hill, even if there's a long way to go still. Uh, so to reiterate, if we understand that isolation is a critical part of the problem, and we understand the deep challenges that we face, but we also understand the serious costs of doing nothing, then we can take any one or all of these steps related to norm setting and repetition, related to creating information access, related to shifting the way we interact, whether it's the structures that we have, the reporting systems that we have, the ways that we talk about these issues over and over, um, using that, adapting what is working in every different context, as we often say, even at an institution like Columbia, local knowledge from one university department to another makes a big difference. Obviously, from one society to another makes a big difference as well. Uh, none of this is easy. It's so hard. It's exhausting. And I want to really acknowledge and affirm that. Um, I've been working on these issues a long time. I know many of you have been working on these issues for some time or a long time. Uh, sometimes it does feel a little like one step forward and then a couple of steps back. Um, at the same time, <clears throat> I want to affirm that each of us can make an enormous difference. You don't have to make a difference for the whole world or even a whole community. You can make a difference with one other person. And if you start there, you can make a difference with a few others. And I do deeply believe that collectively, together, that is how ultimately we can change our world for the better and bring all of our, all of our communities to a greater place of justice. And now I will be very glad to sit down and talk with you about whatever questions you might have or comments. Thank you so much. There is so much in what you said, and it's just, yeah. I, I, and I think I'm going to ask both as, yeah, someone on the personal level and also on the kind of structural level and what we've been thinking about in terms of, um, the response to what happened, Janash, and of course, it's just this is just one example. The first question I have is on a personal level, uh, which um, I've had in the last month. I've had one of my closest friends be sexually harassed, and I had another uh, female friend, and I had another male friend be racially uh, harassed. Both have both have decided not to press charges. They have exactly what you were talking about. Um, in the tr female friend because of guilt and self-blame, uh, male friend because he didn't trust the system to be on his side. And, I, and one of the things that you know was important as a somebody as a supportive uh, thing is not to kind of push your own agenda. And but everyone around them was saying you need to get justice. You need to get justice. You, the, the person needs to be punished. And if you could just talk a little bit about that in terms of like, you know, the need of the, those who are not involved of like seeing punishment, whereas a lot of times the survivors are like, no, we, do, we actually, is, is this something, you know, if you could just, yeah, talk about that. The other issue um, that we've been thinking about is how economic violence is intersectional with gender-based violence and how, uh, especially in, the terms, yeah, in terms of this, uh, with the Jarash incident, we had, this is, was not just, a, you know, this was not just any woman, this is a woman and a man, the whole family living on 80 JDs a month. Um, that, you know, there was economic disempowerment and there is violence that is just in, in, in these poor communities that is just everyday violence. 
So this was like an extreme situation of this violence, but there's this everyday violence. And how can we move, how can we politicize these conversations more? That it's not just violence against women, but there are vi there's violence against these whole communities. They are being impoverished. And how can we politicize it more? And finally, very quickly, if you could just, re just say the name again of the, uh, the support uh, mechanisms that you have in Colombia, the, the website. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, you got away with three questions. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask everybody else to try to make it one question, but thank you for those questions. Shall yes. I go ahead? Uh, th yeah, th thank you for those questions. And I also, I really, am, uh, th I really want to thank everybody for being here. I feel very honored to be able to have this conversation here tonight. So um, I, it's a very, very important to me, as, as you can hear, and I appreciate that it's an area of interest and importance to you. And it's a conversation that we don't often have in this country, correct? I'm also very glad to be, to be part of that. And, I, and I, I would just say on that note, even though it is a conversation that, you know, happens often, fairly often uh, in some parts of the U.S., it's also a conversation that doesn't happen enough and can go long periods of time without happening. And, and in some sectors, the isolation and that sense that this isn't an issue of importance, you know, happens, happens everywhere. So, so those are, these are three, these are three uh, or two great substantive questions. The website, by the way, if you Google the words sexual respect and Columbia, you will come across the Columbia Sexual Respect website and maybe afterwards I'll tell you why we named it that. Uh, so on the personal, I think that is a great question, right? What, how can we support somebody when um, they don't want for their own reasons to go forward to the authorities, right? Uh, as you mentioned, I mean, it's, it's extremely common. Uh, many people, perhaps most people, don't want to go to the authorities uh, with a variety of issues. So there's that overlay. And then when you think about the second overlay, that sexual crimes, and I'll say something about racial harassment in a moment too, but sexual crimes can be among the most uncomfortable because people are uncomfortable, generally speaking, talking about sex. And even though these are crimes of violence, they still require people to say words about body parts and words about experiences that are uncomfortable, that layers over all of the other shame, the self-blame that may happen. <clears throat> um, with respect to racial harassment, part of the issue there can be uh, <coughs> also that it is a fundamental challenge to an individual's identity in a society and sense of membership in a society to be harassed because of race. Who am I? Right? It is a reiteration and a reminder that because of one's race, one isn't a full citizen or at least not seen that way by the society. And so there is a, a very existential difficulty, personal, that can come along with that, as well as a fear right, that any of us might have about, it. well, if I complain, am I going to be targeted for more harassment and retaliation? So what I would say specifically with respect to people who don't want to report uh, sexual crimes <clears throat> to the authorities, I mean, the first is that when somebody has been sexually assaulted, uh, that is a profound taking away of that person's agency, right? They've, they, in that experience, did not have control over themselves or their bodies. And so one of the most important ways any of us can support someone in that experience, and I'm, I'm sure that there are many people in the room who ha both have had the experience of being assaulted and have supported friends and family in the experience of being assaulted. Um, the most important thing any of us can do is to affirm the person's agency. Right? You get to make your decisions. That's what's most important here. You do have control here. There are some crimes that, of course, the police will find out about, but in ones where, where that is not necessarily apparent, to me, that's always the starting point. And then the second point is, you know, I want to listen, right? I just, I want to listen to whatever you want to share. I'm not judging you, I'm supporting you. And that way, again, affirming that the person affirming the person's value and the person's worth because the act of the assault attempted to take that away. 
The third and related point is reminding the person that they really are not alone. And that, was, that is the power of Me Too. That is why Tarana Burke sort of call, used that phrase, was to say to the young women who she was talking to who have been assaulted, Me Too. And where it came from was she was listening, was providing support and counseling young women who had been assaulted, but she never told them her own story and her own experience. And she felt that she had missed something in sharing that. And so by saying me too, it was a way of saying, truly you're not alone. All that said, this, the prevalence and the, the sort of frequency of assault reinforces why shadow reporting and anonymous reporting is so important. The fact that somebody doesn't want to go personally and report and tell an authority what happened to them does not mean that their experience needs to be lost. And some people may find it empowering if they don't want to go to the authority to at least have reported somewhere, to have a record, to have a number, right? This did happen, this happened here on this day or if they don't even want that, this happened in this month. <coughs> And so the idea of advocacy organizations or communities creating mechanisms for that kind of reporting can be a very powerful bridge. And sometimes over time when people have reported in that way, it's a gradual process, they can come more to the experience of being willing to report in other ways. We find that is actually true at the university where students may talk first to a counselor and over time find enough healing in that experience to be able to go further. <clears throat> but we never require it. <clears throat> and then in terms of the, 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 the let's just say two things, uh, maybe two other things quickly. Um, one other very powerful practice, as you probably are familiar, is restorative justice in this area. And that is the idea of a community holding its members accountable. Ultimately, that winds up, I think, in many settings being a more powerful way to empower the, to, to change a community because the men and the women in the community then take responsibility as a community for declaring the behavior wrong and for in the future making sure it is clear that that behavior is outlier behavior. Outlier behavior by which I mean it's not okay. I'll quicken up. That was, and then let me just say last, last thought on the e economic violence. Um, two things. One, sexual violence and domestic violence cut through all economic classes and there's often a narrative, and I know you weren't as making this point, but there is often a narrative that this is a problem of poor or impoverished communities and I, I suspect everybody here knows that, but it is just not true. It is also true that violence can be pervasive in communities that are stressed economically and are targeted for brutality in other ways. And you're right that to think of challenging these issues as a piece of a broader framework is very important. I also do though want to underscore that it happens everywhere in the, high, in, the, in the wealthiest communities as well as in the most impoverished and every place in between. My name is Lex Tackenberg. I'm the, I have been the chief ethics officer for UNRWA, uh, the uh, UN agency for Palestinian refugees for the past decade here in Amman. And in that capacity, I've been doing a lot of work on sexual misconduct. And I was very happy to hear uh, your, uh, your comments and, and, and sharing uh, a number of best practices uh, which resonate Quite a few resonate with uh, with with the experience that we have gained over the over the past decade. Uh, I don't have any particular questions, but I just want to to contribute uh, uh, a few uh, a few remarks uh, and inviting you perhaps to uh, to react to them. Uh, a first a first thing that has worked for us is to uh, to place uh, sexual misconduct firmly into a broader framework of of corruption. 
uh, anti-fraud, anti-corruption. Uh, Transparency International defines corruption as an abuse of power, an abuse of authority and trusted authority for personal gain. Uh, and one form of personal gain can be for sexual purposes. So Transparency International calls sexual misconduct the worst form of corruption. And I think they're right uh, to do so. Uh, it has been useful to do that in multiple ways. Uh, first, it has uh, enabled us to, uh, to avoid having to create sort of separate reporting mechanisms, specifically zooming in on, on, on sexual misconduct with all the sensitivities around it and the, you know, the sensitivities of raising awareness around it, but rather have generic uh, misconduct channels through which both personnel and beneficiaries of our services, we, we operate 750 schools, we operate 130 health centers, uh, and we have a, a big relief uh, infrastructure. So we're a big, a big service organization with over 30,000 employees. Uh, so through which uh, both personnel and beneficiaries can raise concerns uh, without being stigmatized. Uh, another advantage of looking at sexual misconduct also through a, through a corruption lens is that in those situations where indeed survivors are unwilling to formally come forward uh, and therefore you cannot really you know, engage in a, in our case, in a disciplinary process or in a criminal process, uh, being aware of the fact that there are concerns about a certain perpetrator can, can help you to sort of uh, keep an eye on that person. And what we see very likely, and I, I speak from a decade of ex experience, uh, is if someone abuses their authority for sexual gain, they're likely to do it also for financial gain or for other personal gain. And we have had quite a few cases in which, you know, we were not able to, you know, address a perpetrator uh, directly because of sexual misconduct, but because of the wider set of, 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 of misconduct around it. I think Safwan is telling me... Uh, yeah. This is, is very, very, very helpful and interesting. I just want to uh, honor the time. Uh, a, second, a second observation is that uh, in terms of prevention, and I think it, it, it chimes in with, with, with the points that you made about institutional trust, uh, what we try to do is promote an ethical culture, and we see key, four key levers of, a, of an ethical culture. Ethical leadership, uh, a robust, uh, regulatory framework, uh, adequate processes, uh, you know, for example, for reporting allegations, etc. Uh, and finally, ethical awareness as sort of key, four key elements of promoting this, et this institutional trust that you refer to, uh, or ethical culture as we call it. And we, we, we pay a lot of attention to development of ethical leadership in that, in that context. Thank, thank you. One, one last comment, very briefly, if I may. Uh, I'm also making the case that sexual misconduct extends beyond gender-based violence. We have uh, recently dealt with a situation in which there was a consensual uh, relationship between a senior official and a more junior official where both abused their authority to pursue that relationship and travel around and, 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 and so forth. Uh, and so it's important to also uh, recognize that sexual Misconduct can happen in a situation where the, the underlying relationship is consensual. Thank you so much. I think those are fantastic points and, and resonate quite well. As the next per microphone is being passed to the next person, I'll just say that one of the things we do at Columbia, and maybe I'll take a couple of questions together if that will help, but one of the things we do at Columbia is put these issues in a framework of community citizenship which is meaningful in our context. Corruption is very meaningful in many other contexts, but probably not our university setting. And so that then says to everybody, whether you think you care about this issue or not, whether you would engage in this behavior or not, whether you think I'm a good person, I would never do this to anybody, so this has nothing to do with me, we link the idea of sexual respect and community citizenship to say, if you're a member of this community, there are certain expectations of community citizenship that we have relating to many, many things, self-care, looking out for others, and a range of responses to rejecting harassment and misconduct of all kinds. So, so I'll take the question here and then the two over there. Let's take more field. Yes, yes, I'm coming to you, to you, and let's start over here. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, thanks a lot. I was interesting to come here to hear some practical solutions based also in Jordan context. I'm sure uh, you are following on the news, maybe also the situation in general. Um, in workplace, we have many issues, and within the six points you reflected, I think it addresses internal measures, putting good policies, strong policies, sensitization, etc., which is something we do. But our main challenge actually is external. Because, first of all, we have a cultural norm that is very powerful. Even the mindset of our staff is difficult to change. Uh, we have legal work flame that is not clear. So even if we have a case, we don't know what's next. In terms of protection also of victims, we can do a lot of measures, but finally we cannot protect uh, women who come to report or who face issues, even inside uh, the work from colleagues. For, uh, I would reflect also that men could come for such, uh, you know, it's not only related to women. And I have a very big challenge, which is difficulties in investigation of these cases because of mostly harassment is a perception issue. It's not related too much to intention. You can still perceive something while there is no clear intention on harassment, which make it very difficult to judge. So as you mentioned, it needs skills development. Uh, then the major issue we face is the uh, no reporting. We do not receive reports. And actually, the main trigger for us to work more on policies and uh, empowering women, etc., is that we do not, uh, we do not uh, receive reports. While we know that, we should address that harassment happens all the time. Um, so I want just quick advice from you. In this context, maybe this, the small brief I gave, what would you advise us to do to make it really a life policy, something that we talk about, we address within all the challenges we have? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hi, my, my name is Basha. And, uh, I'm a feminist. Unfortunately, lots of times whenever I drift away from the mainstream understanding of feminism, I get bashed instantly. And to me, I always feel that there is a Western definition of feminism that we imported in Jordan. We have to obey by that definition. Oh, I'm getting skeptic when we're on the phone. Don't get me wrong, I really appreciate you being here. I really appreciate your speeches. But you know, I'm, I'm worried on whether or not we can implement Western feminism in countries such as Jordan. If I'm to elaborate further on this, um, I think feminism, in, like modern feminism, started in the West for simplicity, put it this way, as a product of social historical development that was unique to the West. Oh, uh, the process went through struggles, women demanding their rights, and then they achieved something, and now it's good enough, you know? The fight is still going, but we reached certain levels. But in Jordan, in, in, in the East, in the global South, it seems that we're just importing Western definition of feminism. Even in the US, for example, like there are women of color that started using the term white feminism and rejecting it, and then using more intersectional feminism. Oh, uh, if, I'm, if I'm just to focus on one, one main point, I think, um, generally speaking, Western countries have a higher level of in individualism than Jordan, I would say. Um, we are a collectivist society. Uh, family norms sometimes are treated on a higher level than individual values. Um, and that got me thinking. Um, I was having a conversation with, uh, with a good friend of mine who happened to be very conservative in Jordan, talking about the Jewish incident. And his point was, um, which one is better, to have a family with a blind mom and a dad in prison for good, or try to solve it and to make the family work? Um, I've heard this from someone in Jordan, you know? From, I don't know, we always ditch their perspective and treat it as irrational. But uh, come to think of it, those are part of society. I go back to your point. Um, when you started, uh, the, uh, Mr. Safwan, you mentioned something about um, 86%, I guess, of women in Egypt think that if they dress more modestly, sah, and, and no, no. it seems that women themselves in Egypt don't want other women. Like, this is the absolute majority, 86%. If, um, I don't know if, if, if we should come up with our own organic form of feminism that fits 
the country that fits the collectivist norms, that fits religion one way or the other. And I'm not religious myself, but I have to admit that those are people among our society that we live in. So I don't know what's your perspective in that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I would like to build on your uh, point, Dr. Safwan, when you mentioned that this is a new kind of conversation that we're having in Jordan. Actually, just last year, we started talking about this issue openly. I remember in August of last year, we were in a conference, a huge conference, and when we started talking about violence and harassment in the world of work, in particular on the workplace, we were told, don't you, don't you even think of mentioning uh, sexual harassment? You should call it an insult, because that means for us women, our male members of the family will not allow us to go to work. So, but now we're talking about violence and harassment. We actually have a policy with the Ministry of Labor that they already adopted, but it will only apply to new registered companies, unfortunately, but it's a step forward that we're having, like there is a mind shift, if you wish, even with government employees, and they are accepting this kind of language. And now with the convention that we have on violence and harassment in the world of work that was adopted in the uh, International Labour Conference in June of this year, that would help uh, uh, Jordan also move forward. But my question to you, because in the line of work that, are, that we do, uh, we receive a lot of complaints uh, from women uh, related to sexual harassment. Uh, now some of them come forward and they go and talk to their superiors, the HR department usually, and some of them, they, as, you, as uh, Sarah was mentioning earlier, they shy and they don't want to, to report it. Now with the ones that do report it, usually uh, the corporate culture in Jordan is not really open for such discussions. They don't have policies in place. And the ones that do have the courage, they are asked usually to provide the proof. Yes, with Onurwa, I believe you said that you do monitor that person because usually they also do uh, different kinds of violation, if you wish, of uh, the internal policies of the organization, corruption or what have you. But with these, with these cases, we were not able to help them because they needed a proof. And usually harassment, as you mentioned, happens in an isolated environment. So what do you do? What kind of proof do women need to have, or men, need to have in order to file, probably in Jordan at this point in time, they have to go to court because the HR system is not really uh, providing any kind of support and there are no procedures in place. Actually, when we try to do a quick mapping of the companies, I'm talking about companies in Jordan uh, or private institutions, uh, probably they do not exceed 10 national, I'm talking about Jordanian companies, that do have policies on violence and harassment. So, uh, but again, it's, uh, Jordan is taking baby steps which is good, but then at the same time, as you mentioned, okay, we have maybe the legal part, we're working on it, but how can women be protected? Uh, which to us is also very important. Yeah. Uh, these, these are all uh, great questions, and they're actually uh, all related in, in a certain way, so, so I'll, I'll say a few words uh, about uh, each one, and then hopefully we'll have more time to talk at, at other times because these are questions that could take um, days of conversation. Um, you raised, and you raised in it in different ways, the first and the third speaker, um, about the, that the mindset of the staff is difficult to change, that there are limitations in the law, um, and that uh, most harassment um, is perception, right, not clear intention. And I want to distinguish that from, from the very violent uh, ki kinds of harassment and assault. Uh, I think, I, I actually think these are very important observations because they give us the seeds of what to do. And so when most harassment or a lot of harassment is perception, and we know that, we know that isolation is an issue, we know there are many reasons why people don't report, <coughs> one of the critical steps is to begin to change the conversation, right? Because, because it's very hard to get to the place where people are comfortable reporting without more conversation about what is okay and what's not okay. And so that, which is actually in the, that first point that I offered about norm setting, um, I think is true in workplaces as well as in uh, many other community and government settings. 
And I do think that that is part of having this kind of conversation. It's part of having other forums where these issues can be raised. It's part of in co having conversations about other issues, economic development, for example, and bringing in the costs of not addressing these issues because the costs are quite serious. And that maybe this goes back to, to the third uh, question uh, about how do, we, how do we think about moving companies that are reluctant to move forward. I think people often think of these issues as women's issues, even though they are, harassment is not only a women's issue. And as, as everybody has pointed out in different ways, these are issues that affect whole families and whole workplaces. So beginning a conversation around the costs of having people not show up to work, having contributions not be made, having teams not work well and productively, having products not go to market in ways that are uh, costly to a company, having, and I, I think this may be um, true for, especially with the uh, energy of millennials, having protests and activism in places where companies aren't willing to make a commitment to having a policy in place. I can share with you that in the US, my, some of my experience with this has been around having companies adopt protections related to LGBT rights or other kinds of harassment. And so what was done was first to find one or two companies where the leadership was supportive. Then to have those leaders enact a policy and be examples for others. And again, just with, to start to snowball a conversation so that we started very small and then get, went one to another to another and then have some national accountability backed up again by millennials who are, and I don't mean only millennials, but especially the energy of some millennials and some younger people who are willing to say, these are things we insist on, even at whatever basic, uh, <coughs> whatever basic level. In terms of the clear intentions piece too, I think this is the place where thinking societally about what kinds of conversations are happening culturally, what kinds of conversation are happening in the arts that can inform conversations that are happening in workplaces. I mean, that is often what we see is that the arts will help lead and prompt the conversations as sports do as well. Um, in terms of, of your question about Western feminism, which I think is, is a very important one. Uh, for my part tonight, I wasn't actually talking about feminism. I would love to give a lecture on feminism. I think there's a lot of interesting things to say. Uh, what I was talking about were issues of violence and harassment and issues that, that affect all people, right? They affect women and men and transgender people in communities. And they have great costs. And as you said, actually, they have great costs for families. Where, where, where a culture exists where it, um, if it is understood, at least in some segment, or if, uh, if in one, some segment somebody thinks it's okay to physically assault another person and remove their eyes, that has a great cost to a community, right? It's a loss for the person who is injured. It's a loss for <coughs> the things that person might have done if they had their eyes. And it's a loss for those who are related to and depend on them, whether that person is a man or a woman. Now, you raise the question of, well, what should happen? And there's a question of criminal punishment, of course. And some communities in many places think attempting restorative justice may be a more effective way, a sort of community-based justice, rather than having uh, criminal penalties. Others would say that having criminal penalties in egregious situations is essential, because without that, there is no way to show people that this is not OK. Each community will make its own choice. I don't think that is really necessarily about Western feminism, but it is about a, a communal choice and what works in an environment. I think my core point here though is, is however we think about these issues, harassment and violence, when it's gender-based or it takes any other form, has a very significant cost to the individual who is harmed and to the people who are interdependent with that individual. And there, while certainly you make an excellent point that U.S. can be a very individualistic society and other societies may not be so individualistic. These are, these are, not such, these, these are, are issues that one can see, whether through a collective lens or an individual lens, as 
reducing the capacity of each person and each family and each workplace to contribute and participate as effectively as they can in the well-being of their community, their family, and their society. And a very last point on, on the proof issue. Again, I'll just go back to this and corporate culture because it's, I, I, I'll go back to what I said toward the end, which is the idea of positive deviance. Looking not only at what's not working, but also looking at what, what is working. So what is working that, that led those companies actually and the, and the government to adopt these, these policies, even if it's in a limited scope? And what is working in a world that had so many people turn out for a demonstration, men and women alike, to say this isn't acceptable behavior in our communities. Those are the kinds of efforts that really do, when you look at them both individually but in the broader frame, change the conversation and make new steps possible next week and, and in the next month. I often say in, my, in many places of life, you know, what if I don't want to be having the same conversation in a year? What do I need to do differently now? And these are the kinds of steps that I think make an important difference in having next year's forum look very different from this year's. So we've just run out of time, um, and we could go on for hours. I think, uh, Suzanne, what you've brought to this stage is an incredibly important and enlightened um, perspective. And what I'm hearing from the audience, I mean, I enjoyed the questions and listening to the comments and contributions from the audience members just as much, because this is obviously we just scratched the surface on a multi-layered, I mean, we didn't talk about uh, you know, gender and all its dimensions today, LGBT and so on and so forth. I do want to make just a couple of comments, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, what, what Suzanne is talking about is not feminism, Western or Eastern. I mean, it's really about universal human rights. It's about respect and protection, and those are universal, and they are as deeply rooted in our culture and in our religions um, as it is in, uh, in Western. Oftentimes, however, cultural norms in religion are used to sort of um, excuses, if you will, and that is inaccurate and disingenuous, right? Because the root of the religions that exist in this part of the world uh, are not contrary to the values of respect and of human rights for women and for men. I mean, here we focused on harassment of women, but men are also the subject of harassment, uh, sexual violence and other types of violence. Um, men are exposed to that, not to the same extent as, uh, as women are. So I hope that this is, a that you'll be back and you will facilitate more of these conversations, but I'm really heartened to see uh, the kinds of questions that are being asked and the kind of conversation that's going on. Suzanne will stick around for about 20 minutes or so. Uh, I think where's Hania in the courtyard or here? In the courtyard, so please join us for a cup of coffee, for a snack, and uh, continue the conversation. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you all.